The Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 5 to 10, page 676 in your Pew Bible, if you'd like to follow. Thus says the Lord, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. The gospel lesson this morning comes from the book of Luke. Chapter 6, verses 17 to 26, that's on page 60 in the Pew Bible. Now I had it once upon a time. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. For surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. This is the word of God to the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Psalm 1, and the reading from Jeremiah 17, and the short Beatitudes in Luke chapter 6. And they really clearly frame something important. They frame the choices we have as humans. And it's confusing. Uh, the way ahead isn't always as clear-cut as we would want. Because life can be a very complicated thing. But you know, Jeremiah, Psalm 1, Luke, they show us almost an alternative to merely doing things our way. And so we'll start today looking at the Gospel of Luke. Now, we've skipped ahead in our liturgy readings from last week to this great event, 
the shortened beatitudes that Luke provides for the Sermon on the Mount. But we see some amazing things happening right before. Jesus is moving in the power of the Spirit, and amazing things are happening. People are being healed. People are being delivered of all the things that oppress them from the enemy. And as a result, the disciples are crowding around him, and crowds have come at this beginning of his ministry, and they come from Judea and Jerusalem, and they even come from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, which isn't even in Israel. Those are Gentile places. That's where Jezebel comes from. All kinds of people, Jews, Gentiles, rich, poor, all kinds. And they're all witnessing the power of God coming through Jesus, healings and exorcisms and powers coming out of them as they crowd around him and their needs are met and the world had never seen anything like it. And he wasn't on a mountain in this sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Plains. He's right on their level. Sermon on the Mount, one place, Sermon on the Plain in another. He addressed his disciples with four blessings, and we like to call them the Beatitudes. Now, let's look at them. There are four blessings and four woes. This always confused me when I first came to be a Christian, and I hope that we can clear up a couple of things. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I imagine that makes all the poor people Happy. Remember, he's addressing his disciples, says the crowd, and then there's the disciples. This is going right to the disciples. Blessed of you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. I imagine all the hungry people looked quite expectantly. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And those in mourning looked hopeful. And then he said, blessed are you when people hate you. Yeah, it says that. And when they exclude you and revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. I don't see anybody rejoicing over that. Because wait a minute. What's this? Can you imagine how perplexed they were? He works miracles. All are joined to him. What can he possibly mean? What's coming next? Well, he follows this by uttering four woes after four blessings. These aren't in the Sermon on the Mount. These are unique to Luke. And he says this, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Now that sounds like a prophet. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Now this is awkward. Didn't he just bless the hungry? And now that we're not hungry anymore, we're in woe? I mean, I remember years ago, a friend of mine very confused by this. Wait, if I'm hungry, he gives me food. When I'm eating, I'm satisfied. I'm back to woes again. What's going on here? Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Hmm. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did, the false prophets. And they're sitting there wondering what this could mean. Because while the prophets often talk about greed and corruption and injustice, they don't talk about simple things like hunger and having enough. So I remember hearing this when I was young. I think I must have been a Christian for a whole month. This is in the Stone Age, 1974. You remember those days, bell bottoms? Okay. <laughs> and um, I was someone who had come to Christ with me very young, turned to me and said, I don't get it. So I'm blessed when I'm hungry and poor, but when God blesses me with food and gets me some money, am I suddenly cursed? So do I need to give it away and not eat it so I'll be hungry and poor again so I can get blessed again? But then if I get blessed, won't I be cursed again? It does seem like there's this tension here between having and not having, blessing and woe. Because the very act of giving you something kind of puts you in the other column. And some people have noticed this before. It confuses a lot of people. And quite frankly, some early monastic groups in the 3rd, 4th, and 5th century believed this very ideal, and they dealt with this issue with extreme means by keeping themselves hungry and in poverty and in isolation and unwashed. And some people actually felt the more miserable you were, the better off you were. And that's not what Jesus is doing. 
Because I don't think there's something wrong with not being hungry. I don't think there's anything wrong with some kinds of laughter. I don't think there's anything false about having a good reputation. And maybe there is some things good about being hated, but nobody wants to go around being hated all the time. I don't. Even my dog doesn't want to be hated all the time. We miss something when we only listen to part of this sermon, but something else is very, very clear. And that is, reversal of fortune is a very human experience. Winners often glow, losers often mourn. But we have to understand there's absolutely no permanence in anything that's human. Things can change and will change very quickly. But there's something in this instability that will never change if we root ourselves in God by the streams he provides. And the wise among Jesus' audience knew the scriptures well enough to see what he was getting at. He noticed that even though he's loading people up with woes, no one's picking up rocks to throw at them. No one's trying to throw them off a hill like last time. <laughs> last time I gave a sermon, not here, but in the other church. And people then leave him in droves, leaving just the 12 disciples around just kind of wondering what comes next. Because he's teaching something as a rabbi would. He's teaching something, a lesson as old as the scripture itself, and he's reminding them of the two ways where these things become less important and what we're rooted in becomes more important. And that's why we started with Jeremiah 17. That's why we read Psalm 1 together. And that's why I called this sermon, Be Like a Tree. It's Jeremiah's sermon that we read in chapter 17 is really less known to us than what we read in Psalm 1. But what a powerful image it is. And here's a blessing and a woe Jeremiah style. You can be a tree planted by a stream or a shrub stuck in the desert. One has water, one does not. One's connected to the source, one is not. Tree or desert shrub. And he goes on to say, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They're going to be like the shrub. And here's the rub. Having food or not having food, doesn't matter. Trust in the right thing, that's what matters. You can be a shrub in a dry, dry desert, or you can be a tree whose roots connect to an endless river, and you're consistently green and bearing fruit. There is weakness when you make flesh your strength. And all those woes come from living for the things you get rather than living for the stream that supplies them. And that's where the answer is. There's a weakness when you make flesh your strength. The Hebrew of that literally means there is a weakness to depending only on your own arm. And that's what depending on the flesh literally means. Strength of flesh is depending on your own arms. The same thing is in Psalm 1. That if you are planted by the water, you send roots into the stream, you'll never fear when heat comes, its leaves stay green. In the year of drought, the tree's not anxious, it's got a river, it never ceases to bear fruit. Our own efforts always leave us dry. Desert, shrub, own effort, tree by the river, living for God, going deep. The drought doesn't matter. If you ever have to choose between the desert and the river, choose the river. That's really what Jeremiah is saying. That's what the psalm is saying. And deep down inside, that's what Jesus is alluding to. And here's the best part. You'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, both in Jeremiah and in Psalm 1. And here's a wonderful Hebrew thing. It doesn't mean you are planted there as a seed. It means that some agent transplanted you by the river. Be like a tree transplanted by rivers of water. Doesn't that sound like us coming to Christ? We're born into a world that's dry. We come to Christ and he plants us to a place that's bright and rich and water.
water-fed, everlasting springs. I really love that word, transplanted. We started out somewhere else, someplace drier, someplace more lonely, someplace more barren. Rabbis would talk about the two ways. I'll say, in our sermon, it will be the way of the shrub and the ray of the tree. And there are lots and lots of teachings in the Bible about the two ways. There's a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leaves to death, it says in Proverbs 14, 12. Because deep down inside, there are a lot of people that convince others that a dry desert is a great place to plant a tree. Where do you want to be planted? What kind of source do you want to have? Some of us, oops, I skipped the page, shame on John. This happens often. And I'm going to tell you why. Another thing that Jeremiah brings up, that the heart is devious above all else. It's perverse. Who can understand it? And how does that translate? To us humans, a desert always doesn't look like a desert. It looks better. There's, that's how temptation works. It draws us away from God by making something that looks bad appear to be good. So a desert to us doesn't look like a desert, and our hearts can deceive ourselves that the desert is this great place to go. And as a result, people can choose the wrong way, and wrong way, it gets dry very, very fast. Desert shrub or water tree. And sometimes we're so blind that we can't see the difference until we start feeling really thirsty. What's odd is that even when we choose the right way, things all around us can appear to dry up too. He comes. Jesus warned about that. Right in the Beatitudes, blessed are you when, he names a whole bunch of terrible things that can happen for following him. Ruinous things that happen to good people. Bad things happening to good people. Bad things happening to those who follow Christ have provoked the oldest questions ever addressed to God. Why? It's the whole book of Job. It's the basis of the many questions of Ecclesiastes. So sometimes when I say there are two ways, the way of life, the way of death, the way of good, the way of evil, it's not that simple. Sometimes it doesn't look that simple. Just go to five corners in Presque Isle with directions that say, turn right. And there are a whole bunch of rights. <laughs> it's not always that clear. Because modern life with us has complexities. Every age that we experience have complexities. Even the rabbis who first wrote about there being two ways, a way of life and a way of death, would argue about what it can mean in the details. But here's what's important. The part of the answer we have to maintain. Where is our heart in that time of decision? And what do we really value? The first answer should be obvious. We trust the Lord, and we trust in the Lord. Now, Jeremiah made it a point to say both, that, that trust overcomes the weaknesses that may be in our hearts. It can even overcome our self-deception. Another part that we hold on to in the midst of trial, in the midst of that last beatitude which says, blessed are you when bad things happen, is that the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. It says that in that final verse, a couple of verses of Psalm 1. God's not passive in our lives. He's just not a river that goes up and down. He's active. We trust in a person that cares for us. And in the end, that's what Jesus is getting to. There's no particular virtue in being poor and hungry, sad, or hated. But Jesus had and has tremendous empathy for those suffering. There are terrible people who experience all these things as well as virtuous people. All of us, or most of us anyway, we know how quickly life can change from joy to mourning, from plenty to lack, or from health to sickness. We've all been there. Some of us have even made the journey back and forth between these extremes several times. I can say that's me. 
But what's the key in all this? And all things remain connected, root to water, faith to source, human to God. We remain faithful in terrible times and through terrible things. In the Hebrew mind, the root means permanence. It's the one thing that will never change what you're rooted in if you give diligence to it. And it's no accident. Think about this, that Jeremiah wrote these words of hope, green trees by rivers that never end. In the very last days of Jerusalem, when soon its walls, its palaces, and its temple will be reduced to burned rubble. The river still flowed to his people. So there's virtue in being in all these circumstances and turning to God, choosing God, deciding to follow Christ. That's our hope and calling. So in the end, the exhortation is, look at Psalm 1, look at Jeremiah 17. Be that kind of three. Be that kind of tree. Learning how to talk to the day. And your life will be blessed, no matter what your circumstances are. Amen, folks, and amen. We have some special music now by Mary Joe.